everyone's recording. I'm like, all right, I'll do a little intro mm-hmm. and then we'll do that. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I am uh, very, very happy to have our next episode of Comedy Guy here in the Comedy Estonia podcast studio. It is my honor to have Mr. Tavi Roivas here. Thank you, sir, for coming along. I appreciate that a lot. Thank you for the invitation. Cool. Actually, let's bring that mic. Oh, I've done it. I'm, I'm, okay, not, closer. That's it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. We're not professionals here, Tavi. I don't know if you've <laughs> noticed that. That's not our forte at Comedy Estonia is doing the professional thing, but we're trying. Um, thank you very much for coming in and, and, and donating some of your time. And I wanted to premise this and the whole, I guess the pitch I gave to you was that I'm not looking for anything controversial here. Mm-hmm. I appreciate in your position, usually they want the headline. The people want to hear something. Oh, let me hear the f- intimate fact about the family or something like that, that we can put on the front page. And I think part of what we're doing with these podcasts is actually we can just talk and, you know, maybe nothing interesting comes out of this. Maybe it's <laughs> probably nothing, that's, you know, probably that's great. With, with, with me, you know, it's probably that nothing interesting will, will come. <laughs> and that's cool because people, but then people will know that's the real thing about you. And that's all right. Like you don't have to be, Jumping out no, the, no, the no, car I'm, all I'm the time kidding. and the maniac. I, I hope, and, you I hope know. I'm not totally boring. I, no. I, I still have some edges. I think you're going to be just just fine. So, um, yeah, that's all we can do with these podcasts. I like that, that there's no restrictions, no ads, no advertisers that we need to worry about. You know, if you wanted to go crazy, you could. Uh, it's all of that. So that's why we do them here. So thank you anyway for coming in. So, I mean, I guess, so yeah, part of it also was that I'm not, I don't want to talk about the, the politics or your policies. It's hard to avoid talking about that you are a politician. It is your job, but not to specifically get into what's your opinion on this and that and, and get something out. But I mean, I guess let's start. How has it been as you, as a regular citizen, how has it been to deal with our, our current crisis? Our lockdown, let's say. Well, um, it might be surprising, but uh, you know, it is actually very, very busy di- time also for the parliament. Uh, mm. Our uh, chairman of the parliament uh, t- does his best uh, to to show a different picture, and he, you know, went fishing uh, this morning, uh, even though it's Monday. So <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm not going fishing on a and, Monday. And he actually, you know, <laughs> even if you do go fishing on Monday, you don't put pictures of it on Facebook and then <laughs> say, I got the nice fish because everybody will be start asking, guys, shouldn't you be working? But anyways, <laughs> it has been a busy time work-wise, but I'm a I'm very, very lucky person that I live uh, slightly outside uh, the city. Uh, it's literally like field uh, if I look out of my, my window, uh, which gives us uh, room. I can go for a walk anytime with, with my kids or I go... Um, I go running without meeting anyone, so so it has been relatively easy. And of mm. course, we we, uh, we are renting a, a private house, so this gives us uh, lots of room. Um, and and I, I cannot imagine how difficult it would be if you have uh, uh, five people and the dog, uh, let's say in in a three room um, uh, flat, where for example where I grew up in, yeah. in Uisma. So so it. it we are blessed in, in in this, of course, but uh, but having said that, oh, that uh, of course it's a nervous time. I think yeah. uh, uh, you know you're not used to being at home so much. You're not used to uh, dealing uh, with all sorts of domestic things uh, and uh, and uh, work things at the same time. Mm. Uh, you're getting to used to you know washing dishes and and, uh, (laughs) having some Zoom, uh, hopefully muted uh, Zoom conversation at the same time. But uh, but still, it's it's um, it's nervous time. And and uh, in our family, there is one uh, schoolgirl as well in in fourth Mm -hmm. grade. And uh, it has, I think, especially been stressful for the kids because uh, uh, this e-school well, nobody knew in the beginning how this will work out, and mm. it uh, ended up being very, very stressful. Like you know, our daughter uh, woke up uh, before eight o'clock, and and she was still studying at ten p.m. So, wow. so there's still it, a lot for them to do. I mean, yeah, I mean, we have a lot of facilities in Estonia. We're all pretty connected, but still, this is still a massive experiment. No one could have prepared kind of better. For this exactly, stuff right exactly. now, exactly. But but what will be a very very positive outcome? There will be po- many positive outcomes, by the way, in my opinion, from that very awful crisis. Um, uh, kids will 
be able to use computers properly. I mean, this is the mm. best computer education there can be. So you think before it was just there was the TikTok or the Instagram thing and they weren't really learning yeah, I, how this whole thing could help them? Yes, exactly. Well, uh, my kids are between uh, 1 and 11 and, and they all uh, in some way are very, very talented in, in using computing devices, especially uh, iPhones, iPads, the hmm. tablets, this kind of more intuitive things. But uh, it's another thing if you start using a computer where you use it like, uh, you know, for professional courses. Yeah. And what kids are doing right now, this is very similar to what we do uh, uh, using computers for work. And of course, they are doing something that we are doing right now. You know, they are able to stream, they are able to play with their friends using uh, Zoom or, or Hangout or whatever kind of um, uh, software. So, so they are incredibly clever and and uh, how i ha have seen my daughter playing with uh, her friends it's amazing like they have lots of screens and, and and stuff going on so and they're adapting so quickly to that they just pick it up and go this is what we do now exactly and, and i think what what will change um, probably uh, of all this that uh, we will all uh, decorate a couple of corners in our homes that we actually are you know willing to show uh, <laughs> other people it's, yeah. it's kind of funny you know it's a very very intimate thing in a way to it let is. people to your uh, home yeah. and and it's very interesting to look how people's homes uh, look like and and usually at least uh, most of my colleagues are not uh, uh, not uh, computer savvy enough to to change the background or blur it in any way <laughs> yeah. or, or do this kind of thing. So, so they just, you know, if they are in their kitchen, you see you that really they are see, in yeah. their kitchen. But anyways, I, I think it's uh, it's challenging times, but mm. uh, but there are very positive elements as well. So not, not only negative. I think for us as well, for, for us at Comedy Estonia, uh, we all of a sudden, uh, or everything we do is live shows. That's what we love to do. We love nothing more than every night standing on a stage. And now we're like, no this you cannot do that that thing that you love and the thing that you live for you cannot do that anymore and i mean for a little while we did kind of go like oh shit what do we do and we've as i was saying before we're very fortunate that we already had this podcast studio mm -hmm. we're very fortunate that we already have a number of different podcasts um uh tusi soyad and paikas jankud and kulapod and we said okay we got some cameras, we've got some stuff, let's make the best of it we can. We're not mm. going to sit around and cry and scratch our bums and we're going to make something of it. And for us, I, I think the, the lesson has been we've tried not to bend stand-up to be online. We're trying not to go like, oh, we love stand-up. How can we absolutely, we have to make it happen online. We've said, what else can we do? What else can we do instead in the meantime? And this is where these live streams are coming out in our podcast and we're learning that this is something else. So I, I think maybe for a large group of society, it's like, what else can you do? How can you adapt? How mm -hmm. can you change? How can you be still kind of also with the idea that, I mean, we'll be back. We'll be doing some shows soon. It's okay. You will be doing a lot of jokes on, on this, hopefully. I, I, I yeah. hope this will pass and I hope that there will be, it, it will be, you know, fun looking back at this to some of it. Of course, it's, it's, um, it is still terrible. It, it's, uh, it's health wise terrible, even though in Estonia, so far, luckily, we have been uh, um, experiencing relatively flat curve, which is mm. very, very positive. Uh, but economy-wise, uh, it will be terrible everywhere. And then, you know, Estonia is uh, is a small and open economy and then we will be infected uh, uh, very, very seriously also with this economic uh, virus or, or downturn. But, uh, but it is very, very creative times. I, I think yeah. uh, for businesses, those who think of new ways to do business, they will uh, flourish. And, and the mm. same is, of course, for... Uh, for uh, entertainment sector, it is uh, basically for any sector. Mm. You need like this is like you know digital revolution uh, uh, multiplied by <laughs> ten, or or this is taking things so so much faster. And, and it's like we now have to like okay, we're all e Estonia, yeah, yeah, yeah. We've all flown the flag, and we've I've been there, you've been there, we all do that. But this is it. Now's the time for us to all dance well, and really live that. And, and now we can actually explain uh, all other countries why it is actually kind of 
point, pointless to hand out papers with with the conventional <laughs> handwritten signatures. Yeah. I mean, come on, there can be some sort of virus there. So, so <laughs> there is no viruses in uh, in digital signatures. So so you know, makes sense to to have a proper digital ID and and digital signature also also globally. But of mm. course, where Estonia has not been very good in in uh, all this e stuff is e commerce. Estonia has mm. been officially among the last uh, countries in in uh, Europe in terms of uh, uh, the how widely e commerce is used or the percentage mm. of, of e commerce out of uh, all all uh, other things. Part of it is probably because uh, the big chains like Amazon they started shipping here relatively late or much later than uh, than mm. uh, the big markets but uh, but also our own uh, shops have not been very prone to e-commerce you know, in Estonia everything is so close you can go just go in and buy it in the shop or I don't know wh- why it has been this way me too. I've been. Uh, I bought a couple of weeks. Uh, admittedly, it was in the crisis, but I bought a couple of books from a local bookstore, and it still took them five days. I'm like, wait, it's five streets away. We know this book has to come from the other side of Tallinn, and it's still, uh, yeah. I mean, we've got enough infrastructure, but we're not. Uh, I don't know. I wonder with that. Are we? Because we are so small, like I, my American friends looked at me and I love being in America when I'm there. And that afternoon, the Amazon package is at the front mm. doorstep. And then my friend was looking at me who lives in Atlanta and he was like, dude, you're just whinging. You like, what are you? Come on. And uh, we are behind anyway, but yeah, I well, know. I mean, I mean, but this is changing very rapidly. And, and also I'm very interested to see how we can, uh, you know, optimize this um, delivery process. Currently, we are experiencing shortages, for example, in packaging or like putting the stuff together. Like mm. if I order uh, lots of stuff uh, from uh, Selver or, or Coop or, or uh, Rimi, then uh, the problem is not in delivery, but the problem why there are uh, long waiting lines is, is that uh, people cannot like put you know milk next to eggs and, and next to all the mm. other things I, I I ordered but I think this again like calls for innovation calls mm. for automatization uh, uh, and and I think the autonomous uh, shuttles or autonomous uh, transport robots uh, uh, will not look as uh, out of this world uh, anymore because you know contactless uh, is the new thing and, and this is the new black i think we did sort of i at least i looked at those uh those lockers the coop has and i went well, i don't know, i just got why do i need to go i just got out of coop it seems easy i gotta make the order i gotta think ahead what i know oh my god this is too much and now all of a sudden six weeks later we're like yeah i need that coop locker that i'm gonna be able to do, you know exactly and especially you know in in our case, uh, we have three kids and, and two of them are very small, so it's it's kind of everyday st- behavior for us already pre crisis that we order stuff to our garage and, and keep some supply there. Mm-hmm. So we are, you know, whatever happens, uh, <laughs> there is some sort of uh, resilience there yeah. or like uh, enough enough uh, supplies. But but I mean, yeah, probably the consumer behavior will change. But there is also one thing that will immediately change back. Uh, and this is people, you know, want to go to hang out with friends. People want to go mm. to restaurants. They want to go to theater. They, w- I, I mean, I, 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 uh, I'm quite sure that there will be boom uh, of uh, all sorts of entertainment um, things once this virus thing is somewhat under control. I think so too. And I think my thoughts have now been, as my, I mean, it's my job as I'm leading Comedy Estonia to think about where this comedy thing's going, what are the next steps, what do people want? And my thoughts are now already past lockdown, but the, my thoughts are now at what happens when we're past lockdown and we all like different venues have live stream cameras going on. We're mm-hmm. now getting things delivered. Everyone's on Zoom. What, what happens when we're used to this? and we're allowed to meet again. And this is what consumes me. I mean, let's say from an entertainment perspective, copy car, keep your papa carded down there. They call me up, they go, guess what? We're putting in some live stream cameras. It's going to be cool. Mm -hmm. I said, that's a cool idea. Mm -hmm. I'm not thinking though, what they can do in the next three weeks when they can have a band performing to five people. I'm thinking how cool that's going to be when there's a band performing to a whole room of people Mm -hmm. and they're live streaming it. 
Uh And now I'm already sort of trying to think that far ahead. And that's to me, when we take what we know in lockdown and then we apply it to what happens when we can meet again, this is where I think the, the next thinking goes on. It's, it's probably so that just like social media has uh, revolutionized the uh, news consumption, uh, now as everybody becomes a streamer, everybody <laughs> becomes like, uh, you know, this v- video video conferencing, video potting, all of this is, uh, is um, I don't think it will uh, disappear after crisis. Yeah, uh, yeah. There will still be room for that. Uh, especially with friends who are uh, far from you. Mm. I mean, Zoom party with friends who are in a different time zone, for example, or or in a way, Zoom uh, or, or whatever t- uh, teams can, can help you um, get, uh, like meet friends uh, much often, and especially those friends who are like um, um, less close to you. Mm-hmm. And also, I, I guess that uh, this will also change the way we work because uh, uh, it might even, you know, this is very brave idea because uh, all the world is going towards uh, being more urban and, and so forth. But in Estonia, uh, where we are less urban yet, uh, still than Finland, for example, uh, and the trend is clearly towards going to cities, uh, perhaps now we will see also uh, possibilities to you know working more from let's mm. say some nice uh, place in Sarema. I mean that that might actually work work out uh, that you can do much more uh, work related things uh, with Zoom and and it doesn't matter that you need to be at the same uh, same uh, like office uh, all the time. I would love that. And for me, also, that is a nice part of Estonia that our real estate is still pretty reasonable. Mm. I'm a poor, I'm a poor piece of shit. I don't have enough money to get a place, but I could ima- I could imagine being a little out in the countryside. Th- it's a little bit easier. It's quite nice to be out there. The property price is a bit mm. better. We don't have this crunch in the middle of the city that can't go on forever. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I like it a lot. Yeah, and and uh, it's it's a huge luxury to have so much uh, beautiful uh, territory as Estonia has. Mm. Uh, 45,000 uh, square kilometers and only 1.3 million people. So there is literally a lot of space per every <laughs> citizen. And uh, and uh, this also, of course, is very positive for uh, social distancing. You, know, you probably <laughs> have noticed that the Estonians uh, keep their distance uh, anyway. So you, know, you need, don't need government to tell us that you, know, you don't go closer than one meter to each other. Uh, Estonians are anyways like keeping social distance and, and uh, living in, in countryside sometimes or enjoying it at least. But where did you, you said you, I mean, you live outside right now in a, in a house, but you said you grew up in Uisme, did mm-hmm. I understand? So where, in an apartment building or what, yeah. was, what well, was the environment you grew U- up in? Uisme is a very typical, uh, uh, like apartment uh, uh, area that was, uh, or apartment building area that was uh, built during the Soviet occupation. Mm. So all the buildings look uh, exactly the so same. So you grew up in a Khrushchevki apartment? Uh, it's not Khrushchevka, it's it's a bit different. It's okay. uh, it's um, actually, it looks, Uizma means uh, a flower hill or like hill of flower. And, and uh, it's um, a pond in the middle. Then there are oh, uh, yeah, kindergartens, yeah. then schools, then uh, uh, nine story buildings with uh, some uh, 16 stories. And then I lived in the outskirts, which is like five story buildings. And, and uh, it, it's all uh, the shape of, um, of a flower. Mm. If you fly over it, you, you will see it and, mm. and uh, you will definitely notice it. It's actually very logical city planning, uh, even though it was planned in the early 70s. Um, it's actually, it's, it's an urban jungle. It's, it's a yeah. total urban jungle. And if you, I, my favorite thing is if I have friends from Tartu, you know, if you want to have anyone from Tartu uh, uh, getting totally confused, mm. just take them to Isma because <laughs> they don't understand <laughs> how this can work. Sense. That uh, every place looks like <laughs> the same, same, and, and how can you you know find your way uh, around this area? Because when you were when you were growing up, so that was because uh, I, I, I looked quickly, and you're you're a few months older than me. I'm uh, I'm forty, and you're a few months older than me. So that means that when you were growing up. 
Uh, I mean, it's the 80s, it's the mid 80s, it's the late 80s, and then we're hitting independence. Mm -hmm. So do you have those memories of those last days of the Soviet Union? When How yeah. far do your memories go back in East May? Yes, I, I went to school in 86, which was still very much uh, Soviet occupation. Uh, 87, uh, I spent my summers in... Uh, in Tapa, which is okay. you know only only Estonians uh, have this sense of humor to to have this kind of a name of a place, which in English means kill. <laughs> but anyways, uh, and it's it's a military military <laughs> base also there. Anyway, and it was during the Soviet occupation. But uh, my grandparents lived there, and and that was the area where in in uh, Viruma where. Um, all the people uh, started protesting against uh, the mines of phosphorite. Mm. Uh, it was um, partly, uh, I would say, partly uh, uh, against uh, environmental uh, damage, but also clearly against the uh, Soviet regime. And, and particularly, there was again uh, planned another uh, mass uh, migration wave of, of workers from, uh, from uh, Russia to to facilitate that uh, all this uh, new new mining and that was kind of one of the starting uh, points of, of the uh, singing revolution or mm. national awakening so one song um, um, no land is alone or, or, or no no county is alone uh, uh, that was and that is covered very cleverly by by mm. uh, that was uh, that was the time and, and place where it started. So I have very strong emotions from that time, mm. and also uh, late eighties was uh, was clearly the time when when you saw the changes uh, very quickly. But that was also a time of uh, um, when we. Do you mean Finally, so social changes or? Yeah, I mean, the uh, end of eighties was like uh, new things were possible. Mm. Uh, first new of all, it was 80, okay. eighty-five when Gorbachev uh, came to power. He, by the way, he visited Isma. Oh right, that's, okay, so that's it. Number one, old Borky that, down there. Yeah, but Gorky. that's uh, yeah. that was a funny thing because he was uh, supposed to go to one shop in Isma, and as as um, in uh, Soviet uh, times, there was nothing in the shop, or like <laughs> half of the shelves were empty. And uh, of course, when Gorbachev comes, you cannot afford that. So, so you need to boost uh, up uh, all the supplies. You have all the shelves full. You, they even renovated the counters. Everything <laughs> was very, very posh. And then Gorbachev uh, was uh, probably by mistake. I don't know. Perhaps he said, let's go to this shop instead. Or, or it was just a logistical mistake. He was taken to another shop. <laughs> or the driver might have been from Tartu, actually, because you know, <laughs> <laughs> might have confused uh, which shop is which. And, and it's, this is very easy to do if you're not from Oisma. Uh, so, so anyway, he went to a shop that... Um, that uh, uh, that wasn't renovated and wasn't full, <laughs> and, and uh, that was a m must have been very big disappointment for the for the leader of of one sixth of of the planet. As yeah, right. that was eighty seven that he came or something, was it? So, sorry, when did he come? When did Gorbachev come to Eastman? Uh, it must have been eighty seven. Yeah, okay. I'm, I'm quite sure. That's a big thing for you as a kid. Yeah. Uh, no, okay. By that stage, we're know. like we're, I, we're I mean, out. By that I mean, stage, I I I needed you know back in eighty seven, I needed to go to kiosk and buy a uh, sign of uh, Lenin uh, to wear. Uh, that was compulsory. Of course, but, okay. But that <laughs> was the end of my my uh, communist career because I was this, um, it was called a kid of October. That was the mm. the lower level of, of communist uh, like hierarchy. Uh, I mean, I, 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 I was clearly untouched and my parents actually explained me quite well that uh, this is all like crap and don't say it at school but this is all uh -huh. anyways uh, and and uh, already like uh, late 80s the national awakening thing and then the you 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 could buy for your own money the first uh, national flag that wow. was very very seriously um, uh, forbidden before you know this kind of bit by bit uh, opening how does that even i mean is it that I'm, I'm trying to work out how does the society get to that? And is it because Gorbachev comes to power and he's holding on less and less a little bit? He's not quite, I mean, we're not saying he's a great guy here, don't get me wrong, mm -hmm. but he's a little less authoritarian. Mm -hmm. He understands the world is changing a little bit. And then some Estonian guy goes, I'm going to make a flag. And, you know, someone has the, the balls to 
make a flag and sell it and then no one stops him and that's a thing. Is that how it goes? Yeah, well, it, it happened, uh, and this is why the Baltics, uh, Baltic states are co- uh, very uh, often uh, considered to be very homogeneous, which mm. which they aren't actually. But but we we actually had similar developments in all the Baltic states at the same time, and probably we are the closest to the West and 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 to the Western culture and and definitely and, and uh, many. Many people that I know, like the, who are older than me and who visited Estonia from, let's say, Georgia or Ukraine or, or Russia during the occupation, they said that going to Estonia was already back then like going to West. So mm. it, it it must have been somewhat different. Um, what happened in the eighties? Or yeah, I think Gorbachev uh, played a, a very serious role. Uh, he had uh, initiatives that uh, were called Perestroika, Glasnost. Like I wouldn't say that they are. Um, opening the society uh, according to our today's or, or according to Western uh, uh, level of thinking, but but it, it was still something. And, and also, at the same time, um, what was also important, just one detail, mm. uh, we were able to start uh, seeing uh, Finnish television. Uh, mm. Again, played a big role, a window to the West. And then uh, I think... Um, Separate events in in all separate uh, Baltic states, but but it, it happened like bit by bit. It wasn't like you know one guy uh, uh, making a flag. It was one one starting point, at least as I remember it from my childhood, was, was this uh, uh, people's uh, uh, anger against this uh, new mines, and, and it was mm. it was uh, shown as environmental, which was allowed even in Soviet Union, but everybody knew that this is this is it. This is not the only uh, environmental and Estonians have been always very good in, uh, like, uh, speaking between the lines, yeah. and and it was it was very much needed during the Soviet occupation. So the song that was "Yola uh, Uks or "No Land Is Alone" was actually a very very patriotic song, and and also in uh, a year later, in uh, eighty eight, uh, the the real like big climax uh, of of uh, of uh, this uh, singing revolution was uh, uh, 300,000 people in the uh, singing grounds uh, and, and there were political um, uh, speeches and and there were songs and i remember it it was like you know bit by bit uh, escalating mm. until it was like okay now let's all take out the flags and like sing like crazy and and uh, and you know no one can do anything, you know. Even Soviet Union was hel- uh, like helpless. If if three hundred thousand uh, people go together, you, what can you do? You cannot like arrest them all. It wasn't. Uh, possible. Isn't at that stage? I mean, at some stage there. And uh, my history, I am no history scholar as an Australian, but at some stage after that, the Russians go oh, and they try to send some tanks in. We've got the sort of siege of the TV tower around yeah, this that, stage. That was, they try some things, but that, yeah, but that as was you a bit, say, that was a bit. Uh, it wasn't so much against the uh, national awakening, I would say, but it was uh, it was a coup attempt in in Moscow as well, and mm. so Gorbachev was uh, sent to one of his official uh, uh, summer residences or tachas, as, as Russian call, uh, Russians call them, and and this was a coup attempt, and uh, and uh, it was just uh, kind of getting control of the critical elements in in all areas not only it was not the only it was the same was basically happening in Moscow in 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 Riga in in Vilnius slightly different days but still mm-hmm. and that of course gave this window of opportunity that if we declare our independence now uh, then we can, like it was very very similar to the uh, time where we originally declared our independence it was the uh, it was just between uh, Soviet and Nazi occupation uh, in 1918 uh, uh, when there was like this very very small window of opening and and then it had to be declared Mm. and and, uh, yeah Hmm. it's I mean, I love talking about those days because I was just this kid in Australia. I had no idea what was happening, no true understanding being on the other side of the world, what this was all about. So sorry, even I'm just, just... Sorry, yeah. I just I made, made, made a mistake. But it was, of course, uh, I was talking... In Freedom War, of course, there was no uh, Soviet and Nazi occupation, yet, but it was basically yeah. just before Estonia entered to Freedom War. So that right. this this um, re- op- uh, window of opening of, of Soviet and Nazi occupation has also been, but that was, of course... 20 plus years later. So <laughs> I, I assure, to make clear I assure that you I, anything you actually, say. <laughs> I actually remember some of the history. I just 
confused Tiberius right now. Anything you say is far more historically accurate than anything I have to say, so it's fine. You, you're you yeah, good with it. The point being that it was a yeah. very important um, uh, moment in time mm. and, and sensing this moment and, of course, uh, taking a huge risk in, in doing that. So, um, And you even remember that as yourself personally and your family in mm-hmm. Eastmay, like, this is it. Like, yeah, we were, when the tanks came, we were at... Um, we had this kind of, um, uh, you know, so Soviet kids before being this um, October kids, they became pioneers, which was mm-hmm. again some sort of uh, Soviet, uh, Soviet education thing. Uh, they had special camps when they went during summer, uh, and um, and uh, those camps already transferred to this kind of family like retreats, or you could go there like. Uh, it's a bit hard to explain, but it's like where people go to spend their summer and mm. hang out with other families and so forth. And we were uh, with my family there, uh, next to next to uh, Perno, uh, not far from Perno. Mm. And um, and uh, I remember the the leader of the camp. <laughs> camp, it sounds so. Yeah, I get you. Camp has some weird connotation in yeah, English. It's, it's, um, yeah, no, no, it's, and not I, I resort. Don't, does it work either? I, like, it's yeah. not. You know, it's resort is way too glamorous for that. <laughs> but it's it's basically like uh, it, it's okay. Yeah, anyway. Vacation area or something. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's a vacation area. Let's put it this way. <laughs> and and um, and uh, the like. Let's say director of or CEO of the hotel in today's uh, standards, uh, he said that, uh, don't worry, the tanks uh, might, uh, you know, enter Tallinn or whatever. We have um, two big uh, farms nearby. We have, um, um, uh, we can make our own pork, basically, with yeah, the, like we got thousands it. of pigs here living. So, so we will survive. That was, the, <laughs> and everybody was like, yes, we will survive. So, so this citizens, um, citizens' willingness to uh, suffer difficult times uh, just to get the independence. Uh, that was actually amazing. Yeah, that's. Uh, I mean, that's so funny. We may have independence. The tanks may roll by, but don't worry, you'll be fine here. And, and also, of course, uh, economic difficulties because uh, uh, Soviet economic model was uh, like real crap. Uh, <laughs> planned economy simply doesn't work uh-huh. and uh, and you cannot decide in Politburo uh, what uh, products to produce and, and how much they uh, cost. Or the, the, the result was that there was no products available and, and it, it, was, it was really a mess. And, and uh, it was clear that in the uh, early 90s when we got our independence back, we had to start the economy uh, from scratch. Mm-hmm. There was also like different important details like uh, ruble devaluating a lot and lots of other things. But basic point was that the economic model had to be changed. Lots of jobs that were very, I can't say well paid, but they, they were like, you know, considered like good jobs in the Soviet time. They disappeared like overnight, basically, mm. and and uh, how this transition worked and how people survived, that's I mean that's that's a miracle I would say that's uh, that's really really impressive how Estonian people could uh, and not only Estonian people of course many other sure. uh, countries uh, cutting uh, get, uh, getting their independence back as well. Um, it's it's like I. I I think we should like uh, you know be very proud of our parents' generation because they yeah. what they h- how they survived this time. It's, it's Do you think beyond our imagination. Um, like because I mean with that I mean that was an amazing time. That was I mean obviously a revolutionary time, and I, and I, I'm not trying to downplay that by making a comparison. But go with me on a comparison here that with the current situation we're in. Like Australians are fucking stupid. Oh my God. Australians don't want to lock down. They're protesting. They put a fence around the beach. Some guy busts in because he has to go for a swim. Absolutely has to go for a swim at Bondi Beach. And they just, they're very anti-authority, very anti being told what to do, which is also has Mm -hmm. a fair side to it. On the other hand, it's like, you fucking idiot, just stay at home and get better. And Estonians have dealt with this time uh, really well. So not only just that, you know, Estonians were willing to go with it and come together, but what even in, 
Like now we kind of feel like we see where this is going today. The the, the government has given us some more guidelines about mm. how long this is going to last. And we sort of have a roadmap. But in those first days, I mean, that was, we were all on edge in those first couple of days of lockdown. No one knew. We were all living day to day. Are there any comparisons to those early days of independence where you also had no idea what you were doing next week to here? Or are they, am I drawing yeah, too yeah, long I, of a I comparison? Think, well, I think I think it uh, does make sense a bit. Uh, I think uh, Estonians uh, also uh, recovered from uh, the economic crisis uh, 11 years ago mm. relatively well or, or like survived it relatively well because of the experience. I mean, my mm. generation let's be honest, does not have the, the experience as, as uh, my parents have because sure. they were, you know, I, I went to, let's say, fourth, fifth, uh, sixth grade. Like, okay, you have you see the stress, uh, but, but you know, you, you need to do your math and then and, uh, <laughs> and, and this is like separate. But, but they had to literally survive. They literally had to, uh, you know, find a way to make a living. And, and there were, of course, that was also a time of uh, uh, huge opportunities like... Mm. Uh, so, so if you were clever enough, uh, you could you could live uh, much much better than before, and, and that's what what actually happened. And the, the uh, very fast increase of of uh, income happened, like in the society, quite clearly. But uh, I, I, I'm I think you're right in saying that the Estonians uh, have this historic uh, memory that you know, okay, if we need, we can you know take some pain or we can. Uh, we can be resilient to, mm. to all sorts of things coming at us. And I think this is a very good thing. Um, I think you're very right to say that the Estonian people have been uh, impressively disciplined in the beginning of the crisis. I a bit disagree on, on the current situation as, as I don't think that the messages for the government uh, from the government are particularly clear because you know clearly if you look at the criteria that the government has put in this uh, exit strategy, those criteria have met, been met already, let's say, between one and two weeks, depending on which criteria you look. Mm. And, and having a little bit of ease in some places could actually um, be this kind of um, valve that actually gets some pressure out and, and, uh, and people would behave uh, reasonably. And now what we can see, you know, even if we go out in, in this telescope area, you see more and more people coming out. Uh, they're not all necessarily, uh, they're still quite disciplined, I would say, but, but it, would be, so. it would be much hel more helpful if there would be like clear guidelines that, okay, it's okay to meet your friend. It's okay to do this, that, uh, but but please don't do that. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, just let's keep this structured like what is okay and what is not and I think I agree with you I think maybe I sorry I when I when I said that I think the government has been clear only because like literally 30 minutes before we met someone sent me a message and said oh the government just gave some guidelines okay. until September mm -hmm. or something and I okay. went oh and I, I also was extremely frustrated until that moment 30 minutes ago and I agree we were like what yeah everyone's going out having a party on the street because no one's given us any new information in the last three mm. weeks. Mm. We know it's serious, but no one sort of kept on saying, this is still serious. Um, yeah, only because apparently now something okay, has just got released. I haven't, yeah. I haven't looked at this uh, this uh, announcement yet, but I, I hope that there will be like as, as clear as possible rules. Mm. And I mean, it is, I think it's possible to have even events with, with more people but but you need to have standards and everybody has to behave accordingly. Uh, I mean, you can have uh, public events as well if you do it responsibly and, and you, you still not get infected. So the balance is, is uh, difficult to find, but but, uh, but I think also it, it is important to consider economic factors and, uh, and consider that uh, you need to restore the... Uh, overall healthcare uh, as, as fast as possible. I, mm. I, this is happening right now, but but uh, in terms of economic opening, uh, it is uh, it is going to be very very difficult. Sure, it is. Yeah, we, I mean, we're thinking as well. Uh, we, I mean, we always with Comedy Estonia, we always want to be following the guidelines of the law. We don't even really want to be pushing it. We're not trying to push it and find some angle. Uh, we're hoping that maybe by summer we could have maybe outdoor events. Maybe there's mm -hmm. a way that we could separate people to be far enough apart and still give them a thing where we're thinking maybe we want to do some of these podcasts live 
to large mm -hmm. groups of people, maybe something out here in Teleskivi even or mm -hmm. something like that. So we're looking very closely to what we think, what, they, what they're going to say we're allowed to do and we don't want to push it, but we also want, people need something. People will need something, so we're trying. Yeah, and, and, and if there isn't uh, a clear message what can be done, then uh, people start improvising and, and they can, or they just, you know, say that, come on, the statistics is not that bad. Mm. So they start deciding for themselves what they can do and what they can't. And this is potentially far more dangerous. I agree. Yeah, this is the tough one. We need someone, we do need someone to come back. So let's see, we need to, I don't know if all that information is correct. I only got a message from a friend of mine okay, 30 minutes before. Let's go through that and uh, yeah. then come back. To and that. then come back before we make some. Uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's, um, yeah, those, uh, the old days I was, um, I was saying to some friends of mine a, a couple of few months ago, I was in Berlin and I was staying in the, the Eastern side of the, the wall. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I, for a moment I freaked out and went, Oh my God, I'm here in history. I'm mm -hmm. here in the East. I'm here in, uh, in, in, in East Berlin. Wow. This is, this used to be it. This used to be the place mm -hmm. used to be a, a forbidden place. And then I, I sat back and had my coffee and went, wait, I live in the former Soviet union. Mm -hmm. Why am I so impressed by this? Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, anyway, for me, those stories about the old days are, are so fascinating. And then we were getting into what it was like in those early days. And um, and, and some people could adapt and some people could change and, and some people found it tough and, and all that. What did your parents do? What were their, their jobs? Well, that was a time where there was... Uh basically lots of things at the same time and and uh, mm. what basically uh, took care of our family was the let's say small entrepreneurship and and starting uh, uh, like starting to become entrepreneurial and and uh, precisely uh, my my stepfather uh, had um, one of the first uh, two tuck Two truck companies. Two trucks. No yeah. shit. Cool. So when I was a kid, uh, I I had lots of uh, opportunities to go and and tow some cars. So it okay. was quite exotic business back then. It was yeah, but it, it was just like many other companies. Uh, it was um, uh, built jointly with the Finns. Mm -hmm. So it was typically like Finns come in with some uh, cars that they don't need anymore, and they mm -hmm. get the majority share, and then nah. the Estonians get you know, all the work done and they get some share as well and then they jointly do it. So that was actually very helpful. I mean, having Finland as a close neighbor uh, uh, helped us to kind of bounce up very quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, Estonia and, and Finland uh, are close in very, very many ways, uh, including language, including like being yeah. slow and, and uh, <laughs> extrovert. So, so that's, as, a, as an Australian, you probably have noticed that uh, that we are a bit similar to Finns. Ah, uh, look, Finns away. Hello, yes, you all see from Finland. Yes, oh my God, Finnish people. Finnish people, uh, amazing engineers. <laughs> Amazing engineers, amazing farm people, managers. I'm not so sure, but um, but with uh, I mean, the, was it with with um? I remember when I was young as well, tow trucks, right? Only because I had some friends who would, who were my uncle and stuff. Um, was it the thing that if the tow truck whoever got to the accident first, they got the job? No, no. oh, it wasn't <laughs> like this. <laughs> there was basically like two or three companies in Estonia doing all the towing, okay. and it wasn't that big of a deal then. And uh, and like uh, the biggest company had like two cars, uh, so or three. So so it was basically you just had to call to to one of the three numbers and and just order this tow truck. Oh, because when get. I when I was young, about the eighties, like it was a very cutthroat business. I think maybe even with the gangsters, <laughs> cutthroat. And so every tow truck was like a massive big tow truck, but it had a big engine and it was all tuned up. And it was if they heard on the radio there was an accident, whichever tow truck got there first <laughs> got the job of towing it. And then they got to take it back to their mechanic I, shop and then okay. they got the job to repair it, the insurance job. So this was like... I am uh, I am very sorry that the students didn't come up with this because <laughs> it actually it sounds very glamorous and like a uh, drag race to, yeah, to yeah. towing uh, cars. But uh, our, our uh, tow truck thing was much more Estonian, much more calm without <laughs> any drag racing. 
and <laughs> and everybody just you know knew those three numbers and they or if they didn't know we still had those yellow books where you looked up the numbers mm. some of the companies and this is a trick they learned from finland where also those yellow books are very very popular or very very popular uh, some of the companies called themselves uh, uh, like let's say you want to name your company something yeah, yeah, yeah. but then you put a in f- yeah, like yeah. a something yeah this is it yeah so uh, a a a towing a, company a towing yeah company. one two three but, a uh, towing it, 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 it makes it makes sense uh, to be a uh, a t- towing company in English, but in Estonian, like, ah, oh, <laughs> doesn't make any sense. But some companies do. I mean, they just had in English, it doesn't make sense in English. I mean, sure, ah, uh, and then our towing company, yeah, but you can only one person do that. So they were just AAA towing. Yeah. Okay. Like AAA towing, AAA, like, like AA question, exclamation mark. Good thing is that there are not so many companies in Estonia. So, yeah. yeah. Anyways, it was uh, it was a very very interesting time, a very challenging time, yeah. and it's fun to look back to that. But you wouldn't really want to repeat all the suffer. Mm. Uh, I'm I'm extremely glad to to have been part of this, uh, like or experiencing this as as a kid, and of course this changed uh, everything in my life and and in in everybody's life who's 40 right now or 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 any like at basically in any at any age because uh, without uh, getting our independence back uh, it's like even difficult to imagine where where we would be or, or what would what would be happening and what a unique part for your generation that you remember both you remember those days pretty reasonably mm-hmm. clearly but now you also know what it's like to be a hip member of the world community and mm-hmm. have all the internet and you remember when there was no internet and there was that crap shop that Mikhail Gorbachev had to mm-hmm. with nothing in it there that um, I mean the kids won't quite know that at uh, that same you have that v- foot in both worlds almost that's correct yeah it's it's uh it's difficult to explain my kids uh, that there was Soviet Union and it was a really like awful time. I, I I hope it doesn't you know become like oh like it's uh, so those interesting old times that they become somewhat like um, mm. uh, punk or like nice or like you know nostalgic uh, for generations who haven't uh, experienced it themselves, you know all the Soviet occupation was terrible for Estonia. It started with uh, with war, it started with uh, uh, with um, sending big part of our population to uh, mm. concentration camps, killing them. You know, th- this was all a nightmare. And then the no freedom of speech, uh, nothing. So, so um, there is nothing nostalgic about it. Uh, or if it is, then definitely not the regime, but, but just to kind of, this, it, it I mean, I get. I guess it, it's good to make fun of about it because mm-hmm. it, it was so absurd in a way. Uh-huh. The closest I have um, uh, gone to to this Soviet time, uh, uh, like déjà vu, is is two places. Uh, one was uh, Turkmenistan, mm-hmm. where the cult of the leader and uh, and the regime being like definitely controlling everything is is also absurd. Uh, and the other is like on the exact other side of the world. I hope I'm not like mistaken too much with my <laughs> geography right now. I'm just trying to imagine the globe uh, is in Cuba. Mm. Uh, in Cuba, I, I visited in 2005 and uh, there uh, I went to shops where only Lucas can go. And it, uh, there you couldn't use this convertible ruble that uh, not ruble, sorry, convertible yeah. peso that uh, that uh, you and I as a tourist can can buy for dollars or, or euros, but it was the non-convertible, mm. uh, and and the sh- uh, shelves were empty, and that was actually very similar that in uh, Soviet Union you also ruble was not convertible, so there was was no way of buying anything from the free market, and uh, yeah, it's it's. It's very very sad to to see that, that there are still some places in the world where communism or, or basically this similar ideology is is still continuing and and it's also I think it would be suicidal to to start a communist party in Estonia yeah. because uh, you would not get any any votes for sure. But <laughs> you need know, a better branding than that. <laughs> yeah, but, but in in some countries in Europe we have yeah. like. 
people who consider themselves Marxist or communist, and they are not afraid to to uh, bring it out. So, mm-hmm. so it, it also reflects that not all of the world has actually seen and understood the, uh, I would say, uh, grave ugliness of of this uh, communist regime and and all the consequences. I have one uh, one weird item of nostalgia from the last days of the Soviet Union is uh, one of my big hobbies is I collect retro video games. Mm-hmm. I love it. I love Nintendo. I, we got one. We got a Nintendo sitting right there. That's Tim's. I love old Sega. I love all the old stuff. I don't play so many new games. And I managed to inadvertently obtain a, it's a Sega master system that was produced only for the Russian or Soviet market mm. in the very last days. And it's got a really low serial number, like 300 or something. Mm-hmm. And as I've, and there's very little information out there about this unit. Um, and as much as I've understood, it was the very last one or two years of the, the Soviet Union. And Sega wanted a bit of that market because you had the the dendy consoles, the yellow mm-hmm. cartridge that most people mm-hmm. had. And they said, okay, we're going to get in there. We're going to try to sell this. And so they made a version of the Sega Master System just for the Soviet Union. Um, and the, but the problem was that the unit was at a somewhat reasonable price, but the games were still the mm-hmm. international price. So you could may I mean, again, maybe like a month salary for the system, but four month salary for mm-hmm. the game. I don't know mm-hmm. why there was something mm-hmm. like they couldn't price mm-hmm. the game. And so this never went anywhere. And I went, to, I bought it from a guy in Latvia. He sent it to me like an online purchase and I got it. And I went, wait, this doesn't, something's wrong with this. He sent me some shit one. I don't know what this is. And I did some digging and I went, wait, this is one of 300 that was mm-hmm. produced in the Soviet union. And to me, it's an interesting example of when the those last days when things were coming down before it was uh, Gorbachev was opening up ever so slightly, mm. and the West was like, ah, oh, maybe you want some Coca Cola, maybe you want a little bit of McDonald's, maybe you want a Sega Master System, and how well and not well some of those efforts went. Yeah, I'm quite sure that uh, uh, the concept of um, playing uh, paying for something that is like physically you can touch like you mm. know this is like the console yeah this was acceptable but playing uh, paying for something that is like software i think it took a lot of time before uh, uh, people uh, started accepting that so the piracy element was i don't know if you could uh, have pirate piracy co- console cassettes probably well that's what dendy have. was dendy was a ripoff of okay. Ni- of japanese nintendo the original one so yeah. so so probably yeah. you can you can uh, uh, have that as well and and uh, and that was also like selling uh, soviet union any type of software was a huge challenge yeah. and I, I believe that software companies uh, and didn't make a lot of money in the first years. I, I haven't looked at the stats, but I, it, it would seem very logical. They didn't. There's even, I mean, there's a great story, if you have some time, the story of, um, I mean, Tetris is the classic mm-hmm. video game that was produced in the Soviet Union. And it's an amazing story when you really get into it that they made this game and they sent some discs to the West. And these guys are like, they understood this is going to be a winner. Mm-hmm. But trying to get the rights, they're coming to the Soviet Union. The state says, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, mm-hmm. these are ours. But they're and the whole thing's falling down where they're trying to organize two, um, two Western companies have both got the rights for Tetris. Like that's an also for me, it was a great story about those days. And again, how they saw software and um, yeah, even in um, when I first came to Estonia, it was 2006 and I needed a laptop. I was a traveling, I was a backpacker and I needed a laptop and I, uh, I went, I went to Audi in Tartu, great mm-hmm. company. I don't mean this is a bad story about Audi. And I said, I'll need a laptop. And he said, okay, here's a laptop, however much it was in Kronz. Mm-hmm. And I said, well, I'm a traveler. I, I'm just traveling through here. I don't have anything. I'll need a copy of Windows. And he went, Windows? What? You want to you wanna buy Windows? <laughs> And I was like, yeah, man, I don't, have, I don't know how to download it here. And he went, hold on. And he went through a drawer. And he shuffled through and found a Windows disk with a key. Mm. And he said, okay, I can sell you this for whatever it was. And uh, yeah, that was a great. Yeah, so you, 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 you made last. a big purchase in, in software uh, that, that day. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it's, I, I think it's, um, again, something that will uh, will uh, change uh, in uh, in not only in Estonia, but uh, and then this uh, these countries who have been occupied by... by uh, 
by Soviet Union that uh, you know paying for uh, services, paying for uh, software, is uh, paying for subscription. Mm-hmm. It's a bit like uh, it's a bit new thing still. I would say that you know it, people. Um, I don't know if it's a very Estonian thing or is it, if it's international, but but buying like a CD or DVD, this is like okay, you get something even though it's like pointless to have this. It, it's actually a waste uh, if if you can. A DVD is lower it. quality. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, it's four eighty p, not even seven twenty p. But people are more resistant to paying for the same thing uh, as a digital file hmm. because they don't get anything like physical or or any like you know. That, that's that's the that's, uh, even though it's actually the 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 actual value is is not the plastic or or anything, but it's the it's the movie or or software itself. Yeah, we do that at our shows. We um we sell DVDs, which at first seems a bit stupid. Why are you, why are you selling a DVD? And I agree, it does sound stupid. Um, but what we what be but people want something. They want a physical souvenir mm-hmm. of having come and you can't sell them a promo code on a bit of paper. Mm-hmm. There's no mm-hmm. emotional attachment to it. So what we do is either you can buy the DVD and either we've put a USB in there with mm-hmm. the HD 1080p file, or we also give you the code mm-hmm. that you can then go home as well as the DVD, get the 1080p mm-hmm. HD file. But yeah, in principle, the DVD is... Yeah, but <laughs> I th- is it the student or is it like international thing that you are, you are like more open to paying, let's say, ten or or twenty euros for the piece of plastic than for the right to download something? I think it's still international. I think it's a human being thing. Like even if you consider a comedy Estonia show, you watch the show, you love Sander Uygis, he you've really laughed at his stuff. You come out and there's Sander and he's a nice guy and he's mm. gonna take a photo with you and he's gonna sign it. You can buy it from him there and he's gonna sign it for you and you take a photo with that. Mm. It's it's not about not even about the special, it's about that memory. Mm-hmm. It's about that physical token that I had mm. that experience. Mm. Uh, and the DVD just happens to be something that you know, can can personify uh, even that. even uh, chasing unicorns a very yeah, good yeah. movie. It, it sells a lot of DVDs, which is mm. like you know this is all about uh, tech. It's all about taking things to next level. But but the DVD uh, I've heard is very popular. And you and so that was the if people listen, that's the movie that you had a, a nice cameo star in the Estonian movie. Yes, that's my uh, first and uh, probably last uh, <laughs> time in, in appearing in any <laughs> any good movie. How long was the filming for that? Was it a day, a couple of days to do your bits? Uh, to do my bits, it was like a few hours. Okay. Yeah, it actually, I'm, I hope I'm not telling a big secret. It ha- happened uh, like a few houses. I think uh, we know that, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's Dallas Gibby, so, yeah. Uh, yeah, it was actually actually Thunderbeam's office where we filmed my part and, mm. and uh, it was it was very very good experience because uh, Lisa and Henrik are both such fun people to work with mm. and I mean uh, you know my, my my part there was was very very small but uh, but uh, you know I, I spent few hours with them and it, it was really hilarious like they are they, they get you know you, you must know like how do you get this? How, how do you find all the jokes? Where do they come from? I don't understand that. It was a great movie. I really enjoyed it. I think it was also a great tour de force for Estonia. I think a uh, good plot, funny film. Uh, it was a love letter to, and comedy and love letter to Estonian startups, you know, like yeah, that life that we all live. I think uh, everybody who has uh, had any experience with the startup world, they yeah. feel uh, they feel the movie. They you know, it is, of course, in somewhat characteristic way, but but it's like uh, probably the best humor is where you actually, you know, that it's actually you know somewhat true or, or almost exactly true. Hmm. I think it's great. And is it? Um, I guess what am I trying to say? I mean, because you're sort of known as the young guy in politics. You sort of, I mean, I think anyway. I'll go not anymore. Limb, yeah? Maybe not anymore. Yeah, bro, like, <laughs> Now I'm the yeah. the guy that used to be young, uh, <laughs> used to be used to be like Sanna Marin, but uh, yeah. now I'm you know middle aged guy st- still in politics. Mm. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, I, I think uh, being the young guy in politics uh, was um, 
at first, like for the first, I would say, two weeks, it had uh, a bit negative connotation in Estonia. And uh, for all the three years that I was in office as prime minister, it had hugely positive connotation uh, mm. everywhere abroad. So it was interesting. Uh, like after two weeks, I would say it wasn't an issue anymore in Estonia. Mm. At least I didn't feel that. But for, for the first two weeks, I, I went to, I went to all sorts of. Um, TV, let's say news, uh, the same uh, same uh, day that I was appointed as candidate, twelfth uh, of uh, March two thousand fourteen. Sixteen years, oh six, sorry, six years <laughs> ago it was sixteen. It feels like sixteen <laughs> uh, years ago, and uh, every uh, interviewer asked, "But you are only thirty four. Are they international or were they? No, no they were like the Estonian. Seis was a seis at Mart Martis alone, like yeah." You are only 34. Where have you been so far? Mm. Oh, come on, I have been like in parliament for, I don't know, six or eight years. When yeah. I was first elected, seven years. I was first elected to parliament in 2007. So I, I, I wasn't a rookie in politics. Or uh, It's a great point. Why, do, why does it always have to be an old guy? You know, why does it, why are well, we... I, I, I mean, it, it actually makes sense, of course, that uh, you get to the top of your career at certain level of experience. Mm. But uh, what is different, of course, uh, in Estonia is that uh, the the time of of change or the wind of change uh, that blew in the in the um, early nineties uh, gave the possibility for very young people mm. uh, to start businesses, to become bank leaders. You know. I mean, all the people who built Tansa Bank, they were you know, yeah. extremely young. Uh, uh, or um, or the same applies to politics. Uh, mm. Mart Lahr was, uh, was 31 when the he sto- started the, as... The stories as, are crazy of Mart Lahr as, uh, uh, as prime minister. Yeah. But it was perhaps less... Uh, uh, less uh, acceptable, or I wouldn't say acceptable, but it was like less usual to be so young uh, uh, in in 2014. Mm-hmm. But I, I mean, I have been the the youngest in everything I have done so far, almost. So, so I I, I started uh, as as advisor to Minister of Justice at the age when it wasn't even fully legal to become a civil servant. So that was a challenge how to how to uh, how to make this happen. I was 19 and and the head of uh, we, uh, by, by the way I, I became head of uh, that was before you came to Estonia but mm-hmm. I I ended up uh, because I was the only guy from Uisma that uh, our party leadership knew mm. uh, and uh, I was uh, I was um, working in in the change sans- state chancellery back then, and I was appointed as um, as what's the there is no correct English word for this, but but this was like district mayor okay. of of this Isma area, mm. or and it also includes Kakuma and the many nice places. So, so that was I was twenty four. So it's I a saw case, that in your in your kind, CV, and kind I of uh, yeah. kind of I'm I'm used to being the young guy, but you know. That's probably the end of it now because I'm 40 <laughs> and this is officially. Well, we're 40. Oldish. We we trying to pretend to be cool, but no, I can turn the hat backward. But no. Yeah, but seriously, yeah. I mean, <laughs> if you if you were 20, like 40 seemed yeah. crazy old. So I wonder yeah. a bit, and I won't keep you too much longer. But I was thinking this morning about. I mean, as an artist, my career is undefined. Uh, it's my job to make it. And whatever success defines for me is my own definition. There's no ladder. No one's giving me a promotion to senior artist mm-hmm. uh, or something. And and when I started to really kind of think about what it means to have a career in politics and to be a politician, it sounded similar. Like, yes, okay, you can rise through the ranks and be that higher minister and that higher minister and be the prime minister and the president. And I don't know, whatever else, it's something. But it's it's still not like someone's giving you that job. It's still your own mm-hmm. path mm-hmm. to choose and your own definition of success and your own, I mean, there's there's no HR person guiding you through necessarily, is it? Or is that um, what a political well, advisor uh, does? So and so, I, I think at the real top, there are, uh, there isn't like uh, nobody gives you or hands you the job of, of prime minister. This is not simply not possible. No. I mean, you need to, uh, you need to, uh, 
kind of either uh, become the party leader, or like ideally you become a party leader first, mm. and then you get your party to the electoral victory, and then you get to be prime minister. We know that in, in most cases, or not like in many cases, it, it, there have been uh, different scenarios, including my own. Mm. Uh, first time, second time, I, I was party leader, I, uh, the party won the election, so it was much like me being prime minister for the second government was much more by the book than the first time. But the first time was also when you needed to step up to say, okay, I will run for the job. And then kind of the party leadership had to decide which candidate is uh, is best. Uh, before that, I would say there have been people uh, invited to become ministers who uh, woke up to totally different idea of their future. I, I have done these calls a couple of times my in my life as well. I have convinced people to come from civil service mm. or, or private sector to become ministers, and they have ended up uh, being uh, successful politicians, uh, like all of them. Um, uh, the first being uh, Anne Suilink, uh, uh, who is no longer active in politics, but she uh, was elected to, go, uh, uh, to parliament. Uh, Maris Lauri, uh, successful politician, uh, uh, Marina Kaljurand. Uh, so all mm. of them I invited mm. uh, um, from different sector, and, and I have to say that none of them was particularly happy about the <laughs> perspective <laughs> of becoming politician, but they have all done well. And 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 uh, I, I even even though Marina is now in in different party, I I don't regret. Uh, in inviting her to politics because I think that uh, that she feels at home in this sector. So mm. that was the right move, nevertheless. I think she's a hugely credible individual and someone who can only contribute to our Estonian yeah, and, society. And she would probably be uh, the president right now if she would have listened to some uh, wise advice. But, right. you know, she but that's, the ga- that's the game. I mean, it's like, I guess in a way, like showbiz. I can choose to go one way and go down a certain angle or I can choose to, mm. for lack of a better term, keep it real and do what I, I think needs to be done and they can be what advances your career may not be what appeals to you individually. Exactly. Uh, that, that actually, the, the thing was that uh, she was um, reluctant to wait uh, for the pause. Uh, I mean, there was no guarantees uh, back then that she will see the path to, to presidency, but uh, but uh, it w- would have been highly more likely than the path uh, she took, uh, and she chose uh, fr- like uh, confrontation with the reform party, and uh, there was no chance that uh, that helped her. So yeah, but anyways. Uh, uh, the, the, it's it's dif- like different, but uh, but I think the the worst uh, uh, idea for a politician is that you you make this ladder mm. and you think that I need to take every single step. I, I had no intention of becoming uh, uh, any of the roles that I had. Definitely not social minister, which is the most difficult, I would say, minister uh, position in in the in the gov- uh, government. Uh, if you don't count the prime minister, uh, then uh, I didn't plan to become the district mayor. Like all of those things, uh, uh, but but you know, I would have regretted uh, immensely if I would have said uh, no to to any of those uh, offers. Hmm. And those were not like my own choices that I was running. F- for in any way but it was all the cases were like i was invited to do that so either by prime minister Einzip or or uh, or by um, chairman of our tallinn uh, tallinn uh, party district who was kate pentus rosimanos back then not mm-hmm. not rosimanos yet but but right. the same same person <laughs> sure um, oh, I could talk about this forever, but I know that you have a call to take real soon. Yeah, that's true. So we'll wrap it up here. Uh, Tavi Roivas, thank you very much for coming on the podcast. Thank you for inviting. Thanks for listening, everybody. Mm-hmm.